Prof Lim, good morning. Hi, nice to see you, Dr. Ho. Nice to see you too. Are you at home? Yes, I'm at home. <laughs> <laughs> Casual. You're all at home. <laughs> How's Jane? Oh, she's fine. She's fine. We, we, we can't go anywhere staying at home all the time. <laughs> Enjoy the home, yes. <laughs> Okay, we are going. We are about to uh, start streaming live on Facebook. Hi, good morning, everyone. I am Shiza from Utah. Okay, welcome to today's webinar, Point of Care Technologies for the Rapid Diagnosis of COVID-19. Okay, if you have any questions, please leave your questions at the Q&A chat box. Right now, we are streaming the webinar live on KLESF Facebook. Please help us to like and share this video. I will pass the session to Prof. Niao from Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, Utah, to introduce our distinguished speaker for today. Prof. Niao? Hello? Yes, Prof. Niao. Okay. Yes, Good morning. Hi. Yes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this distinguished lecture of the ASEAN Academy of Engineering and Technology. I have the honor to introduce our speaker for today, who is he's Professor Lim Tree Tech from the National University of Singapore. Professor Lim wears many hats. He's the inaugural professor of the exclusive National University of Singapore Society and the head of the Institute for Health Innovation and Technology at the university. He's locally and internationally well known as a researcher, inventor, and entrepreneur who has contributed immensely to interdisciplinary basic and translational research in human diseases, particularly in the development of medical technologies for disease diagnosis and precision therapy. He has hundreds of scientific publications and over 50 filed and granted patents. He has co-founded at least six startup companies for the university and has obtained over 100 local and international prestigious research awards. We are indeed very fortunate to have with us uh, to have him with us today. And I'm sure like me, you just can't wait to hear from him, his recent success in the development of a rapid diagnostic platform for the current COVID-19 pandemic. So Prof Lin, over to you. Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you, Professor Young, and uh, good morning, everyone, especially my friends in uh, our friends in Malaysia and also elsewhere. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, let me share my, my uh, PowerPoint slide first. Okay, uh, can you see my, my slides? Okay, so. Uh, so thank you so much again uh, for inviting me uh, to give this uh, ASEAN Academy of Engineering and Technology Distinguished Lecture. And also uh, really uh, it's uh, also an honor for me to also be speaking at this uh, EKL uh, uh, Engineering Science Fair. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Professor Chiu and Dr. Ho for making, and the organizers for making uh, this uh, uh, arrangement for me to give this talk. Uh, so when they approached me to, to uh, you know, give a, a talk uh, on, on this, I thought that perhaps I will share with you uh, what are some of the technologies we have been developing uh, for the rapid diagnosis of COVID-19? So what I'm going to share with you really is a, uh, is a work that has been done just the last few months and, um, and it's actually ha hasn't really happened in, in, uh, before in my own lab. 
uh, where we came up with the technology so quickly, but I think in because of the urgency of, of this uh, crisis and the pandemic, uh, we were able to uh, uh, come up with two test kits, which I'll show you. So um, uh, the outline of my talk will be as follows. Uh, first, I will uh, 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 briefly uh, mention what are the, uh, why we need to do tests and what are the different tests available. Uh, and then I'll introduce to you uh, two rapid uh, point of care uh, test kit uh, developed in my lab. One is the micro PCR and one is the uh, rapid antigen test kit uh, before I conclude. Uh, so, uh, so this is uh, just uh, taking uh, off from Johns Hopkins University uh, early this morning. So right now, uh, globally, there are already uh, over 71.6 million uh, infected uh, infection around the world, uh, with the US actually leading uh, at 16 million. Uh, in terms of global death, there are about 1.6 million. So to put this into perspective, uh, if you compare the death rate uh, for COVID-19 versus seasonal flu, COVID-19 is actually 2% versus 0.1% for seasonal flu. And that's why uh, this flu is uh, so much uh, more deadly as compared to uh, other uh, types of uh, uh, flu. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, in uh, here in ASEAN uh, or Asia, uh, you can see that many, in fact, if not all the countries has been infected. Yeah, it's a bit hard to see the uh, uh, small print for each country. Uh, uh, so this is taken from the China News Asia, but let me show you uh, the, the statistics. So right now uh, in ASEAN, uh, in Indonesia, we have about 600 over 1,000 cases. Philippines is about 447,000. Uh, Myanmar is 105,000. Malaysia is 80,000. And Singapore is uh, 58,000. And so this is uh, currently, uh, that is taken off at uh, just a couple of days ago in terms of confirmed, uh, confirmed cases. And uh, in Singapore itself, uh, we have actually 58,000 cases, which uh, you know, to me is actually quite a lot because if you consider the population of Singapore is only you know, about 5.8 million people. But of course, we know that the majority of cases happen in, uh, among the migrant workers and has been uh, limited, uh, within, uh, restricted within the dormitories. Uh, but thankfully, in the last uh, you know, one or two months, the number of infection rate has gone down to about uh, you know, about zero or one, I think the last few days about zero or one cases, but majority of cases has been imported cases. So I've been maintaining a, a pretty good infection rate. Hopefully we can continue to, 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 uh, to maintain at, at this, this current uh, you know, uh, low numbers. Uh, death wise in Singapore is 29, which is actually very low, which is also uh, uh, you know, one positive news uh, coming out of it. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, why, why you no, know, uh, why we are doing uh, relatively well compared to other countries because we emphasize a lot of doing testing. And, and we all know that test is uh, very important. Uh, if you look at uh, you know, some of the tests done, uh, the reason why we are doing tests is firstly, we want to quickly identify uh, those who have been infected so that we can immediately isolate, isolate them to prevent spread. And also we can administer immediate treatment to these people. At the same time, if we know who has been uh, infected, then we can perform better contact tracing so that those people who has been uh, around uh, the infected individual can also be isolated uh, uh, and, and quarantined. Uh, in Singapore itself, uh, we have actually been putting a lot of effort in combating uh, COVID-19. So uh, a lot of research now has been done, uh, not only in terms of developing a uh, uh, test kit, but also developing ways of, uh, of better performing the test. So for example, we have uh, in our university, we have been doing 3D printing of the nasal pharyngeal swab kit uh, as shown over here uh, to, uh, you know, for, uh, for example, in the Singapore General Hospital, they have uh, create, uh, developed a swab board where you know, a, a robot can actually do the swabbing. Uh, to uh, uh, our own university, a spin-off, Retonics, that have actually developed a test kit where they can test uh, also COVID-19 from breath. Uh, to other testing, for example, in my, my own lab, we have been developing a PCR, a portable PCR kit uh, to developing uh, other reagents that we can, for example, do PCR in a much faster way. For example, we can do RNA extraction together with the PCR without having the additional step of doing RNA uh, extraction uh, separately. And of course, uh, we have also another colleague who has uh, developed an automated pulse oximeter to measure oxygen level. Uh, 
uh, wirelessly. Uh, for this case, it was used in the uh, migrant worker dormitory. And um, suddenly, uh, the, if you look at all the tests, right, the test mainly is to identify this, this culprit, which is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes the infection. So, uh, so in order in the test that we develop, we mainly are looking for a few things. One is that, for example, for PCR, we are trying to test and identify the single stranded RNA that's inside the virus itself. So, if you look at the virus, it's actually like a sphere uh, with this uh, spike-like protein protruding out. That's why it's called a coronavirus because it looks like a crown. But really, we are looking at a few things. One is, as I mentioned, a single stranded RNA inside it. If we can break the virus and then we do sequencing and we can identify the single stranded RNA, then we know the person is infected. For, for, for other tests like antigen tests, we are looking at uh, viral proteins. So the viral proteins can include N protein, which stands for nuclear capsid protein. And that is the protein that's tagged to the uh, inside the virus to the RNA. Uh, the other protein that we also uh, look at is the S protein, which is this spike-like protein. So S protein st st stands for spike protein. And S protein itself is actually the uh, a protein that enables this virus to tag to an uh, uh, epithelial cell inside the human body and then allow the virus to invade into the, the human cell. So, so basically, we are looking for three things, either for the single-stranded RNA or M protein or S protein. And uh, currently, there are three types of tests. Uh, the first is the uh, PCR test, which is considered the so-called gold standard test because it's uh, very uh, sensitive and very specific. Uh, it's very accurate, uh, but it takes a longer time to, to, to perform the test. The second is the antigen test, uh, which can be performed very rapidly and is inexpensive, but sometimes suffers from sensitivity issues. Then the third is uh, the antibody test, or we call it the serology test. Antibody test is also very rapid, uh, and it can uh, detect for antibodies that has been developed in the human body uh, uh, when the person has been infected. Although antibodies are produced normally about a week later, so the antibody can test whether the person has been infected, but it does not really be able to test whether the person uh, is infectious. Uh, again, because it's uh, very rapid and because of the technology used there, they can lead to some false positive or negative. But antibody is, uh, test is being used to look at population-wise, uh, you know, how, how widespread the disease has been. Uh, but let's go maybe quickly into each of these tests for me to maybe explain to you very briefly uh, what, uh, how it works. So the first is the PCR test, which stands for polymerase chain reaction. Uh, normally what we do is we either take a nasal swab, uh, a sample from the nose, or we can do a throat swab. Uh, and what we do is after we take the sample out, we will put it into a universal transport medium, we call it UTM. And the uh, sample taken from the patient is then released into the medium. Then what we do is uh, thereafter, we will do uh, RNA extraction. So basically, uh, we are able to capture the, the virus, but because we are trying to detect the RNA and we know the RNA is inside the virus, we need to extract the RNA out. So we have to find, we have to use a, 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 a reagent to break the virus to release the RNA. And once it's released, uh, then we can start to perform the PCR. And the PCR basically is a process for us to uh, amplify and, and uh, more, uh, like no, it's like trying to uh, amplify the number of uh, RNA in it. So, this, so it can be from a few copies to hundreds of millions of RNA uh, through this PCR process. And the way it works is we will uh, cycle it up and down in terms of temperature. It will break and then constitute back and then uh, from from a few copies to hundreds of millions of copies. So once it's, once it's amplified, then we can use fluorescence uh, to uh, to detect whether there is a presence of this RNA. So basically, uh, this process, PCR, makes literally hundreds of millions of copies of this RNA and then uh, using fluorescence to detect. So, so you, will, you will see the fluorescence, the curve like this. Uh, uh, the way we analyze the result is to look at the increase in fluorescence level. So if there's an increase in fluorescence level, that indicates that there is this presence of this RNA. And that's how we can detect whether the person has been infected. Then the uh, second test is actually the antibody test. Uh, antibody test actually tests the uh, the um, 
for the antibody. So basically what we do is we will take a blood from patient for this case. And then once we take the blood itself, uh, we will actually uh, uh, be able to then uh, put a drop on this uh, assay here. So, so the, the assay that we use is called a lateral flow assay. It's, it's the same kind of assay uh, or, or test that we do for pregnancy in the pregnancy test kit. Uh, uh, basically, it's just like, uh, like a strip of paper. Basically, the material is made of uh, nitro, uh, cellulose, uh, nitro material. We put a drop of blood over here and then use the paper as a means uh, uh, using capillary effect for the blood to flow through. So if you look over here, there are actually two lines. One line is where we have the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, antibody, which then the uh, antibody would then tag to the uh, uh, the line. So so if it's positive, then uh, uh, we will be able to see a, a, a positive line like this. So if you look at the bottom over here, uh, there are actually three lines. So IgM, IgG are the antibodies. The C is a control line. So the C uh, has to be uh, a line here positive to indicate the process is working well. Uh, so, so for example, if you look at the second uh, result over here, there's positive for IgM and IgG. That means the person has the antibody uh, in the uh, in the blood. Uh, if it's only one line for IgM, that means the IgM is positive, uh, but IgG is negative. And uh, and the same here for uh, for this case, IgG is positive. Now, if you, if you look at the last four uh, 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 results over here, you don't see a positive line for C, which is control. That means the result, uh, the, 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 the test is not done properly, so it's void. Uh, so, so one of my actually uh, uh, startup company, which is now uh, IPO uh, Biolytics, is actually uh, also uh, 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 marketing this particular test kit. Uh, the, the last one is the rapid antigen test kit. So rapid antigen test kit actually use the same principle as the antibody test kit. So it's a lateral flow assay, uh, it's again, like a paper strip where we take the, uh, for this case, we take the sample uh, from the nose uh, uh, doing a nasal swab and then mix it into a lysis buffer. Uh, and then uh, because some of the tests actually test for the nuclear capsid or M protein and protein is within the virus. So we have to break the virus using a lysis buffer. Then after we put a drop here and then allow the, the, the uh, sample to flow through uh, through this uh, um, material here, uh, nitrocellulose material. And then thereafter we can detect whether it's positive or negative. So um, there are currently about seven uh, FDA approved antigen test kit and they are quite portable. So this is one of them by uh, Batten uh, Dickinson uh, where we put the sample over here and then within 15 minutes, uh, we will plug it into this uh, detection unit to see whether there's a positive presence of the antigen. So this is actually the three tests, uh, PCR test, antigen test, and antibody test. So the question is, uh, uh, when do we actually use uh, this test? So uh, if you look at uh, the chart over here, and this is taken from a paper published in Nature, um, at the y-axis is in terms of the time from symptom onset. So zero at, at the point zero is where the symptom starts to uh, manifest. Uh, and before that, uh, we can consider as pre-symptomatic. Uh, so normally the symptom will last about a week. Uh, and this is uh, the chart that shows uh, uh, up to six weeks. So what happens is uh, if we use a PCR test, uh, we are able to detect that the person is infected even from a week before symptoms develop. Because uh, when the person has been exposed to the virus, they will have the virus inside them and the quantity of virus is still very low uh, and you will start to increase uh, as it reaches the uh, symptomatic stage. Uh, but because PCR test is very sensitive, so they are able to detect the person when they have the virus, although the amount is small. And uh, in fact, even after infection, let's say, uh, or after the symptoms uh, has, uh, you know, has ended, uh, the person will still have the viral, uh, uh, the, the, the viral material inside them. They may actually be recovering, uh, but the virus may not be, actually may be dead, but there's still viral material left in the body. And so if you use PCR after week one, we still be able to detect the viral, uh, the, 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 the RNA inside the, the body. But that doesn't mean the person is, uh, is uh, infectious. They can, they, it's possible that they, they are no longer infectious. So one of the maybe disadvantage of using PCR on persons who has already been infected is that if they test positive, 
uh, they may get quarantined, but in actual fact, they are no longer infectious and they should be actually released to go out to work. But if you use a uh, antigen test, which is less, uh, uh, less sensitive, they will be able to detect a person during the infectious stage. In fact, at the infectious stage, the rapid antigen test is, uh, is actually very, uh, uh, very uh, effective. Uh, for for uh, after infection, uh, after the symptom has subsided, where the viral amount is less, then the rapid antigen test may not be able to detect them. For antibody tests, because the antibody is produced after week one, uh, so uh, the IgG and IgM antibody tests uh, will be able to detect after the after week one, but not during the, the uh, period of uh, infection uh, or when the person is infectious. Uh, so if you look at this chart here, uh, you can kind of guess what which are the type of tests will be most appropriate to perform. Uh, you know whether it's PCR rapid antigen test or, or antibody test. So uh, so you may have heard about this uh, news, uh, uh, you know, about uh, Elon Musk. Uh, he says that he's been tested positive and uh, negative for COVID-19. Uh, and, and this is actually possible, as I mentioned to you, some of the test kits are not very sensitive. Uh, so, uh, and some are, so, so you could probably be tested both positive and negative, depending on which stage of infection you are at. So if this is the case, then what is the COVID-19 testing strategy that we, go, we should go for? So uh, if you look at this particular chart over here, which is published in New England Journal of Medicine, uh, the blue line here indicates the viral load. Uh, so during the infectious stage is where the viral load will be the highest. And then as I mentioned, after infectious, there will still be some viral material in the person, but the person uh, uh, may no longer be infectious. And uh, again, the y-axis is the uh, timeline. Um, so, so if you look at um, uh, uh, tests that are very sensitive or not so sensitive. So for example, if you look at PCR, PCR is very highly sensitive, but because they are very expensive, we normally don't perform it every two days or, 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 or every three days. We normally do it once a week or sometimes once every two weeks. So for this case, uh, as an illustration, let's say we perform once every two weeks. Uh, we test one, uh, the person was not infected, so it's, uh, you don't get any results. But when the person becomes infectious, we perform another test, but that could be two weeks later, and it tests positive. And because uh, it's after two weeks and the infectious stage is one week, we may actually miss testing the person during the infectious stage. And the person may be out doing his, his or her own businesses and, and infected other people. Uh, so, uh, but if we go for a low, uh, a low sensitivity, uh, low sensitive test like antigen test, which is very cheap, could be five ten dollars, but you test every two days, uh, you know, repeatedly, you we might be able to hit the point of time where the person becomes infectious because the, the as I mentioned, antigen test can test very accurately if the person has very high viral load, and when we test uh, the person positive, then we can immediately isolate the person. So there's an advantage in using antigen tests in the sense that if we can do it uh, frequently and and uh, you know and and uh, because it's cheap, then we might be able to test that the person is is infectious uh, versus using PCR. So one strategy is that we can use uh, antigen tests to test a person. If it's positive, uh, then we can use a PCR to confirm whether the person is really infected with the virus. So this is uh, uh, you know, a strategy that people are looking into uh, doing frequent testing versus bi-weekly tests using PCR to detect whether a person is infected. So, uh, so when I first started on this research, which is in March this year, uh, and that was just before uh, Singapore went into what we call a circuit breaker period, which is a lockdown period. Uh, we wanted to see if uh, our lab can also contribute uh, because uh, the situation was getting uh, very serious. And uh, because in my lab, our expertise is in developing medical technologies, in particular microfluidics. So we thought perhaps we should see how we can contribute and develop uh, a test kit that can help to solve uh, some of the challenges that the current, during the time the current test was facing. So, what, so during the time when we were looking at the PCR test being done, uh, the PCR test actually takes time and cannot be performed on site 
uh, for immediate results uh, so that we, we will not we will be able to know what to do with the patient or the infected individual because during that time the way the test is done is we do a nasal swab then we collect it in the tube we then transport it into a, a centralized lab uh, where they use very expensive equipment and highly trained manpower uh, to do the PCR test and then thereafter, the, when the result is out, uh, we then uh, be able to send it uh, to the person uh, to tell the person whether he or she is infected. And um, this whole process actually takes uh, about a few days to sometimes even a week, especially at the height of the infection where there are literally, you know, thousands over people. I just in Singapore, we have actually thousands of people infected. Uh, thousand over people in fact in fact when I was talking to uh, some of our uh, you know uh, be, uh, interested party in uh, US who is interested in our test kit they told us that uh, when the person is you know they, when they do a swap uh, of the person and perform PCR test the result can come in like in one week or even two weeks uh, which is not acceptable because if the person is infected then then the person is being released into the community and don't results are only made known after one or two weeks so that could cause uh, further uh, you know spread of the disease so we wanted to see how we can solve this particular problem uh, you know without having the sample taken and then sent to a a, a lab of, uh, and then using expensive equipment and trained manpower to do the test we wanted to see if we can do it on site uh, for the results to be known immediately uh, of course, we, we know this is very important because uh, if we want to open up the economy as well as a lot for travel, uh, we also need very low cost rapid on site diagnostic tests. And so, uh, so our aim uh, when we first looked into this was to see if we can develop a point of care test uh, that is very rapid, uh, that can enable, uh, uh, that's easy to use with quick result without, it's very portable, low cost, and can allow for frequent. Uh, testing so uh, and also it should be able to uh, quickly deploy on site whether it's in a, a workplace uh, in a school clinic nursing home uh, or in the airport uh, so our, our idea is this uh, if you look at uh, this chart over here uh, we want to be able to perform a, a, a high number of tests uh, more rapidly so so this uh, uh, X, uh, this y-axis is in terms of the number of tests we can perform and uh, 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 the x-axis is in terms of the uh, uh, the uh, time taken, uh, the turnaround time to perform the test. So if the person is already in the hospital infected, then we do not need to have a very rapid test. But if we are talking about home, school or workplace, then preferably if you can do it within an hour, that would be acceptable. And then, but if the person is coming into a clinic uh, or, or at the airport conference or, uh, you know, or even in a concert, then we would like to be able to do the test very rapidly uh, and also uh, uh, in a high throughput way. So what we're trying to do is to aim for test kit that are fast, can deploy and mass test uh, on site. And this is the region that we're trying to aim for. So, so with that, uh, let me come to uh, two uh, rapid POCT kit that we have developed. One is the Epidex, which is a micro PCR test, and one is a rapid antigen test. So, uh, when we first developed the Epidex, it's a microfluidic based uh, PCR diagnostic uh, test, uh, and uh, we use uh, this uh, microfluidics uh, for us to perform it. I'll show you afterwards how it looks like. Uh, so currently, uh, in, there are of course uh, already PCR technology being uh, used. Uh, on the on the left is the BioRed CFX uh, ninety six PCR system. Uh, this is actually a tabletop machine. It's actually quite big and heavy, uh, and this is not portable. So uh, we normally would use a system like this in the lab uh, to to test samples. But suddenly, uh, this machine has to be performed in in, in the in the lab. Then uh, there are other, other point of care now, a uh, point of care PCR system being developed. Ever ID is one of them uh, where they can perform tests uh, for this particular unit. They can test it about within 15 minutes uh, of, of the sample. Uh, so uh, they, uh, they are able to uh, you know, do thermal cycling very quickly and, and, and perform the test. This is the one that the US president actually uh, announced it uh, a few months ago, uh, Ever ID. Although they did suffer um, from some uh, 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 
poor sensitivity uh, uh, arising from the, some of the uh, buffer solution they use, which they, they later on uh, rectify. So looking at this, we wanted to also see if we can come up with a point of care system that we can uh, develop and we can perform tests immediately. Uh, so using our microfluidics uh, uh, experience, uh, expertise, we developed a PCR detection unit uh, that is actually uh, very portable. So it comprises, uh, for this case, a PCR and detection module. Uh, and the whole PCR is actually done in a microfluidic chip like this. So this is actually a very small chip here. Uh, the whole system, uh, actually the, the, the main component is the detection and PCR module. This is the tool that we are talking about. This big box is actually, uh, we later on, we managed to shrunk it. This is actually, the, there's a PCB inside there that does the thermal, uh, thermal control. Uh, and the whole system is actually uh, portable and can be deployed on site. Uh, we can actually perform tests uh, from an hour down to less than uh, 30 minutes. Uh, so this is the uh, system that we come up with uh, and uh, to show you um, uh, how portable it is. Uh, so you can see that I'm actually holding the, the PCR system uh, in my hands. It's actually extremely uh, portable. It just, as I mentioned, com consists of the thermal, cycling, uh, thermal, cycle, thermal controller and then the, uh, the PCR unit and detection unit. And so, so with this, we can literally be able to bring this to a school, nursing home, uh, or even the airport to do the test. So the, uh, the important component is this uh, PCR chip here, which make use of microfluidic channel to do the test. So we have four channels over here. We can literally perform four tests, uh, although we normally will do control uh, 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 plus uh, others uh, plus performing the sample test. And uh, what we do is we can pipette the sample into the microfluidic channel here. So just to show you how it works, uh, this is uh, where we pipette the sample uh, into the microfluidic channel over here. So uh, one of the advantage of this system is that we, uh, compared to conventional PCR, we are actually using half the amount of the PCR reagent compared uh, to, to other system. And this is important because uh, during the time when we were developing this this uh, system, and even right now there was uh, a, a kind of a shortages of the PCR reagent consumables. Uh, if we can reduce the amount used, then that will hopefully help somewhat to mitigate the case, the, the situation of shortages, uh, the shortage of, of PCR reagent. And the other thing is also uh, the cost. Actually, one of the big cost uh, no uh, uh, cost item is actually the reagent itself. So if you can use that, then we. Uh, do not have to pay so much more. Uh, uh, so, so this is uh, what we do. And then um, actually during the, the, uh, um, the, the lockdown period, uh, we managed to be able to do uh, laser printing and produce uh, all this chip to do the, the, the test, the necessary test. Uh, and uh, just to show you uh, how it works. So, so this is uh, uh, showing you how we can perform qPCR on the Epidex uh, system. Uh, we first try synthetic RNA to make sure the system work. And for here, we, we spike in 10 RNA copies per microliter. Uh, and uh, normally what we, uh, what, what we do for PCR tests is this. We will, if you look at the movie on the left, you can see there's a fluorescence, uh, a green fluorescence light. And as it undergoes the PCR uh, process, you can see that the fluorescence become brighter and brighter. So you'll come to a point where it becomes uh, very bright and that, sig that, that, uh, that uh, shows the presence of the RNA, uh, uh, the, the, the single-stranded RNA that is present in the, in the sample and that shows that the person is infected. And then on the uh, right movie is the, uh, uh, the amplification plot. So the, on the y-axis is the process intensity and the x-axis is the PCR cycle. Uh, basically what happens is as we perform uh, more and more, uh, you know, uh, as we increase up to 20 cycles, uh, what happens is then we are able to uh, uh, see that uh, uh, there is a frost, there's an increase in fluorescence intensity. So this increase in fluorescence intensity indicates the presence of RNA. And that's how we can uh, determine whether the person has been infected. Uh, so this is how it works, and uh, what we do then, uh, we, uh, we so so over here. If you look at the, this this diagram over here, uh, this is using our epidex system. This is at time zero where we don't see any fluorescence, and this is at 
cycle 45, which is about 55 minutes later, you can see the presence of the fluorescence. On the right here is using the BioRed conventional PCR. So we, whenever we do a test, uh, we will always compare the test using our test kit with a, uh, a commercial PCR system to make sure that the results we get is, is correct. So when we measured the fluorescence and the intensity level, they were actually very close to each other. So that shows that our Epidex system is actually working and we are able to identify the RNA. Uh, so let me show you some results you have obtained uh, doing, uh, using clinical samples. So these are the uh, four channels that we use. Uh, normally what we do is for PCR tests to make sure that the, the PCR process is done correctly. We will have one channel where we put negative control uh, basically, it's just a nucleus free water inside. Uh, and then second is positive control where we put uh, you know, some of the synthetic RNA inside there. And then third is where we put the sample. And fourth is an internal control. So internal control will determine whether we have done the extraction control correctly. Uh, so basically what it means is that uh, for negative control, uh, we don't see any fluorescence because it's just water inside there. Positive control, we should see a fluorescence because we are using a, a synthetic RNA that is uh, a, a SARS-CoV-2. Then uh, for the sample itself in the third channel, if it's M if we don't see any fluorescence, that means it's a negative sample. If it's a uh, fluorescence, it's a positive sample. And then fourth channel should be also uh, should be lighted up if if, uh, if the internal if the extraction control is done correctly. So, so if you look at the channel over here, a third is the one that's very important, whether it's lighter up or not lighter up, because the others will always be negative uh, and then positive, and then uh, fluorescence, again, you can see in the fourth channel. Uh, so we, we, we actually created an app for us to, do, uh, to, to, uh, the, to take the image and then to tell the uh, user whether it's negative or positive. So if you look at the Epidex COVID-19 screening over here, uh, in the first channel, it should be negative uh, because it's negative control. Second, should be po uh, it should be positive because it's positive control. And the third is the sample itself. So if there's no fluorescence, then it's the negative control. And the fourth is the extraction control should be also fluorescence. Uh, if the third channel over on the right is uh, positive, uh, where we see a fluorescence, that means the result is positive. So this is how we can tell whether a sample is uh, has the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, RNA or not. So let's look at uh, some of the clinical samples we have done. So we, we actually uh, obtained 99 negative RNA extract uh, samples uh, from uh, obtained from nasal swab of uh, uh, individuals. And again, the third, the third channel is the one we are looking at. So, so if you look at this clinical sample, each one is uh, obtained from uh, each individual uh, uh, patient. So one is uh, the top row is uh, using Epidex and the bottom is actually BioRed, uh, which is the, uh, the commercial PCR system. So if you compare our system with that using BioRed, they are actually the same. Uh, and for this case, because the clinical sample is negative, we don't see any fluorescence in the third uh, channel. Uh, so, so this uh, shows that our Epidex system is able to detect that the clinical sample is negative. Uh, and again, this is some more uh, clinical results we get. Uh, again, each column is for one individual uh, patient and we don't see any uh, fluorescence. And then for uh, positive RNA extract, which is obtained from patients, uh, we also got uh, the swab samples uh, from the hospital. And uh, again, when we do the swab, we found that for positive sample, there is actually fluorescence using our Epidex system and also using the commercial PCR system. And in fact, for all the positive the sample, we did see a presence of the fluorescence uh, in there. So that indicates that the Epidex, our Epidex system is actually working very well, and we are able to detect uh, positive uh, samples uh, from infected individuals. And this is some more results we get. Uh, so we are quite uh, um, we are quite happy to say that actually uh, so far for all the results, all the clinical samples we tested, we were able to obtain 100% uh, accuracy in terms of being able to identify whether uh, the clinical sample is positive or negative. We also use uh, uh, this uh, 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 technique called RT-LAM, which is also a, a variation of the PCR uh, 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 test, but uh, basically, RT line can be performed at 65 degrees Celsius. And again, it also undergo what we call isothermal amplification. That means 
doing amplification at the same at a constant temperature of 65 degrees Celsius. This test can be done within 30 minutes. And so using our Epidex uh, chip, uh, initially uh, before amplification, all the samples are pink in color. Uh, and then when we test out on the, uh, uh, where there's a SARS-CoV-2 RNA, uh, you can see that the second and third channel over here is actually more yellowish compared to the control, which is pink in color. So this also helps us to identify whether a person has been infected uh, with this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And uh, on the right here is the using the conventional uh, uh, bio-red system to do the, uh, the amplification. Uh, so, so then how do we actually go about deploying this if you want to use this for high throughput tests? Uh, uh, as I mentioned, we, we are using a microfluidic chip. So when we collect the swab sample uh, from the patient, the whole uh, sample prep has to be done in a biosafety cabinet like this. Uh, where we pipette the sample into the microfluidic channel. Once the sample is in the microfluidic channel, it's very well contained. That is a primary containment uh, unit. Then we also put this into a, a, a separate uh, sec, uh, cartridge as a secondary containment. After that, we will wipe it, uh, you know, with uh, uh, antibiotic uh, or with a uh, uh, antiviral uh, swipe, and then after that, we can put it into a PCR module. So in this. PCR module, you can see there are many, many PCR modules. So we, we can actually do multiple tests in one go. After the test is done, we can use a separate detection unit to see whether there's fluorescence so as to uh, detect whether the sample uh, is from an infected individual. So, so the, the Epidex system can actually allow us to do rapid testing from uh, uh, one hour to less than 30 minutes. We can also allow for sample to result uh, quite quickly because uh, the reagent we use can also incorporate the RNA extraction step. So it's also very easy to use and can, uh, as I've shown here, can simultaneous, simultaneously test multiple samples. And uh, they're actually quite portable and can actually be, again, deployed on site. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, as a summary, what we have come up with, uh, uh, a COVID-19 diagnostic system for rapid uh, onset testing. And uh, right now this, uh, uh, the system is actually being commercialized by a med tech company. So hopefully we'll be able to get it out uh, very quickly for use uh, in the community. So the, the last one I want to talk about is the uh, absence, uh, uh, which is the portable rapid antigen uh, point of care test kit. Uh, so absence stands for antigen based uh, sensing. And over here, uh, our idea is to uh, develop a test to look for fragments of the viral protein. So as I mentioned earlier on in my lecture, uh, people can look, uh, most uh, developers developing antigen test kit looks for typically uh, one or two of the proteins. One is the nuclear capsid protein or M protein, uh, which is the protein that, uh, that is attached to the RNA. The second is the S protein or the spike protein, which is on the surface of the virus. So currently there are about seven FDA approved antigen tests uh, most of the test actually targets the end protein and uses the lateral flow assay. So as I mentioned just now, the lateral flow assay uh, uses a, a paper-like material uh, to transport the sample all the way to the testing line and the control line to see whether there's a presence of this uh, viral protein. Uh, so, so we wanted to do a bit differently. We We wanted to see if we can uh, test for the S protein. So uh, we use a different approach, uh, which is an electrochemical sensor to specifically test for S protein in swap samples. So, so we came up with this uh, device uh, as shown here. We use what we call Aptamus to be able to specifically tag S protein. So what we do is we, we take a swap sample and we can actually immediately drop the sample onto the sensor. Or, or because this sensor also looks like a dip stick, we can also dip the sensor into the uh, sample as well. And then thereafter, we can uh, start it into a wireless electrochemical detector, and we can detect whether there is any electrical signal. So if the S protein were to be able to tag to the uh, aptamer sensor, then a, a electric current will be generated. And then from there, we can actually transmit our results wirelessly to a a smartphone or a tablet, and the results can then be uploaded to the cloud. 
So using this uh, technique, we can perform direct tests on swab samples. There's no sample prep needed because we are actually testing for the S protein, which is on the surface of the virus. We do need to have the additional step of breaking the virus. We can have a very quick readout. So 15 minutes is actually what we need to perform the test. And because it's so portable, it can deploy on site for testing. And we can also allow for quantitative readout. It's not just seeing whether visually there's a line. Uh, we can actually measure uh, quantitatively how much uh, viral protein there are in the sample. Uh, so we did many tests and our limits of detection actually uh, is very good. Uh, initially, we test down to what we call one picogram per milliliter. Uh, but subsequently, I think last one to two weeks, we were able to test down to 0.2 picogram per milliliter. So this is actually very high uh, limits of detection. It's a very sensitive uh, antigen test. Uh, but at the same time, we also want to make sure that the test kit uh, only, te only can uh, you know, detect SARS-CoV-2 but not other flu viruses because uh, you know, we are, we are uh, right now uh, uh, approaching the winter season, especially in the northern hemisphere, and this is the uh, seasonal flu period. So when a person has flu symptoms, we want to make sure that we are able to differentiate the, the SARS-CoV-2 infection from other seasonal flu infection. Uh, because all the viruses may have uh, common symptoms uh, like sore throat, you know, uh, cough, sneezing, and congestion. So with that, actually, we started to test on other flu strains, uh, and we are able to actually be able to detect SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein. But when it comes to other flu viruses, uh, the the sensors that we have is very specific. They don't detect uh, the other. Uh, flu viruses. So that's actually uh, very good news for us. That means this test kit is very specific to test testing COVID-19. We also uh, try on uh, nasal pharyngeal swab sample now and our, we are able to actually be able to detect uh, some of the spike samples that we put into nasal pharyngeal swab of uh, healthy volunteers. So I must say that this test is still, still ongoing because uh, uh, you know, right now Singapore has such low infection rate so getting uh, samples are a bit challenging. Uh, so what we do is now we, we spike the uh, SARS-CoV-2 protein into nasal forensic swap protein from volunteers and then see if our system can detect uh, them. So to, to configure this for mass testing, actually we can have a system like this where we can have multiple uh, uh, slots for test strips uh, uh, for this electrochemical detector or we can actually pattern our sensors uh, onto a 96 well plate where each well can be used to test uh, for one uh, one individual patient. So so this uh, we can do direct tests on samples very rapid. Again, we can do it within fifteen minutes. Very easy to use, and we have a quick electrical readout, and also be able to uh, be able quite quickly uh, do data capture. Uh, and as I shown over here, uh, using these two configurations, we can actually do mass testing, and they are also very portable. So we can can very quickly deploy on site and of course, uh, low cost as well. So those are the two tests that we've developed, uh, the uh, uh, micro PCR diagnostic test, Epidex, and the rapid antigen test, kit absence. Uh, and uh, I must say that, uh, uh, you know, I really have my uh, students and postdocs to thank uh, for, you know, uh, putting so much effort uh, into developing this uh, very, very quickly within the last few months. Uh, so what, what's next? Uh, we, we know that you know, in the last, uh, one, uh, last uh, one, two weeks, we've been receiving very good news of very high efficacy vaccine coming in uh, from the Pfizer, BioNTech, uh, as well as Moderna. Uh, and those are very good news because the efficacy is extremely high. It's like 90 over percent. Uh, although uh, uh, you know, uh, FDA has set the efficacy to be about 50 percent, but they are able to achieve 90 over percent. and. Uh, uh, the way the vaccine works for these two companies, uh, Pfizer and Moderna, is they use actually RNA. Uh, they inject the human body with the fragments of the RNA that can pro that can put that can produce a spike protein. So once they once they inject the human body, the cells will then capture the RNA and then start to produce the spike protein. And uh, once the once the spike protein is produced in the human body, the immune system will then be able to detect antibodies to target this spike protein. But the, the vaccine itself is safe in the sense that person will not be infected because they're just producing the spike protein, but they don't have the RNA inside there. Uh, or they don't have the whole virus uh, there to, to uh, be able to do the infection. So, uh, so this is actually how, how they do it. 
uh, uh, the using uh, mRNA. But I think uh, uh, right now, uh, if you look at vaccine itself, we, it's still a long way to go from rolling this out for the 7 million people. And we are still not sure at this stage whether vaccination will give us long-term protection or just warning for a few months. And of course, uh, whether COVID-19 will become endemic, that means it's going to be here to stay and will become like you know, other seasonal flu that we are experiencing is something we don't, do not know. But regardless of, uh, as Harvey Feinberg has said, uh, he's the chair of the Standing Committee on Emergent Infectious Disease. Uh, he said that regardless of when vaccine may become widely available, diagnostic tests will continue to play a very vital role in coping with the COVID-19 pandemic. So we still need all these test kits, no matter what, to test whether a person has been infected. And uh, it's likely the case that not everybody will be vaccinated. As, as we can see the last few days, uh, they are really uh, uh, you know, uh, vaccinating people who are at high risk, uh, those who are uh, elderly and also the healthcare workers. Uh, so this is actually where we are. Uh, so what's next in terms of testing? Uh, I think we are really progressing towards uh, home testing. Uh, so, uh, so there was news uh, last month about FDA granting uh, EUA uh, approval to a first at home COVID-19 test from Lucera Health. So this is a very small gadget over here uh, where we can do our own nasal swab uh, and then put the sample inside this and then uh, on the button and then what we do is they will uh, start to do the, for this case it's the RT lamp process. So uh, by, uh, by uh, uh, doing the isothermal application, then they will be able to detect whether the person is infected. And of course, uh, home use uh, has its uh, advantages and disadvantages in the sense that uh, the advantage is that a person, uh, if it's a person is infected, then they will be at home performing his own test. And if a sh he or she find that uh, uh, they are infected, they can you know uh, quarantine themselves at home. But there are people who also done the test and the authorities have no idea whether this person is infected or not. They may be tested for, uh, you know, for infection, positive for infection, but they may actually still go out and do their own, you know, uh, go about doing their own businesses. Uh, so, uh, so there must be uh, you know, some policy with regard to how home-based uh, COVID-19 test kit uh, is being deployed and used. But I think this is something that people are, uh, are going into. So with that, uh, actually I've come to the end of my talk. I really need to thank my COVID-19 uh, team uh, and for here, uh, uh, you know, Fong is the one who helped me take a lead of these projects. Uh, but it requires a, a very interdisciplinary team because within the team itself, we have not only engineers, but also uh, molecular, molecular biologists and also uh, engineers who can do 3D printing. Because during the time when we were doing, uh, developing this test kit, there were actually uh, a shortage of uh, consumables. There were a disruption in supply chain. Uh, and many of the labs were shut down as well uh, in, in Singapore. So, um, so I think they were very resource, resourceful in, for example, if there are some components we, we don't have, we use 3D uh, printer to print those components uh, and we actually make our own consumables as well. Uh, so really uh, uh, very thankful to my group and also uh, for uh, my collaborators catching on from uh, the National University Hospital who were able to get us a sample to do testing. There's also a lot of, uh, 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 you know, uh, support and also funding obtained from the uh, from our university uh, as well as the National Medical Research Council uh, and hospital as well so they, they actually provide a lot of support which I'm very thankful and then for the uh, uh, absence the rapid antigen test kit I'm also very thankful to uh, my uh, postdocs and students uh, UG and uh, Trifani Yvonne and also uh, Janani and also my students Arjun and, and uh, Bell as well for uh, putting a lot of uh, effort into developing this absence. Actually, absence was only started in July. Uh, so they quickly be able, uh, were, were able to put together this whole system. So with that, uh, before I end, I just uh, wanted to make an actual announcement. Uh, we will be actually organizing a World Congress on Medical Physics and Biomedical Engineering in 2022 uh, from 12 to 17 June uh, at this uh, iconic Marina Bay Sands Hotel. Hopefully by then, we can all be able to travel and we can all, all welcome you to Singapore. Uh, this World Congress is, ha is held once every three years uh, and rotate among, uh, around uh, North America, Europe, and also uh, Asia. 
So uh, in 2022, will be, will be Asia's turn to organize this and it will be in Singapore. We are expecting about 2,000 to 2,500 people. Uh, so we are, we are all welcome to attend this uh, particular meeting. Uh, so with that, finally, I just want to wish you all very well and please uh, stay safe and healthy. And, and thank you so much again for the invitation and give this talk and I'll be uh, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Well, thank you, Prof Lim. Most fascinating talk and so impressive. Yeah. Right? In just a short span of a few months, have been able to come up with three different tests for the RNA, for the antigen, and for antibodies. And I think you also made your own swap, right, with, with 3D printing? Yeah, so one of my colleagues... For collection of samples, yes. Yeah, that's right. So one of my colleagues at NUS actually developed that. that uh, yeah, but your team, great teamwork. I'm really, you know, sh short of words. <laughs> yeah, really impressed. Yeah, in your own words, uh, you know, um, this... this uh, pandemic has disrupted many lives and livelihoods, I think you said in your introduction. But we can also see that it has allowed lots of opportunities for inventors like yourself to um, work on innovative approaches uh, to our clinical problems. Yeah. That's right. Really I think uh, in my uh, whole career, uh, we haven't moved as fast as we did uh, for uh, such a technology. Uh, I, I must say, I mean, for, for, for example, for PCR test kit, it would probably take us maybe a year to two years to develop. Uh, but as in other things, even the vaccine you know, development, uh, things started to accelerate very quickly. And I think we all know the urgency and the need for it. That's why we really work very hard to uh, you know, be able to yeah. produce it. Thanks to modern technology. But I think it's also, you know, your work in getting things ready because you need all the components there. You need the funding, the manpower, the equipment, everything ready for you to go Yeah, when the need arises. Yeah, great. Um, any, let's see whether we have any questions from the audience. Let's give them a chance to ask something. Uh, Prof Lim. I guess. Oh, I have in fact a question about interference of those, what you call that uh, materials inside the blood on your test itself. You did mention that there is, you can distinguish the various types of uh, viruses, but how the, a certain are you when you have more people being tested, that this cross, uh, what you call interference, may actually give you not so reliable results. Can you explain a little bit on that? Okay, so uh, interference, are you uh, referring to other types of viruses or other, uh, other human body? Uh, I can't hear you, really. Uh, yeah, so uh, what interference are you referring to? Is it like different types of viruses? Or different these, these are perhaps uh, uh, what you call viruses, perhaps uh, other materials, inorganic, met uh, metallic, uh, what you call ions in the, what you call blood, would that interfere your result? Right, yeah. Okay, so I think that's a, a good question. For example, we test with uh, uh, saliva and then we test with nasal forensic swab. Uh, uh, there are other enzymes and so on, they may actually interfere with the test, but for PCR test, it's still okay. For example, for nasal forensic swab, uh, for PCR, we can test them uh, very, uh, uh, very, very quickly and also very, uh, in a very high accuracy, with, with high accuracy. For saliva, it's a, a bit of a challenge uh, because saliva has certain uh, enzymes, they may actually break down the RNA uh, uh, or the nucleotides in the RNA. And that's why in saliva, uh, you, you might have also read news that people are trying to develop reagents that can help to, uh, you know, uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, protect the RNA inside the saliva uh, and then be able to use that uh, for us to detect the RNA. So yes, there are certain uh, components in the human, in the bodily fluid, they may actually interfere with the test. And that's where the reagents come into play uh, to help uh, further, uh, you know, inhibit some of this uh, negative reaction that may come from the uh, enzymes and, and so on, and then uh, be able to then uh, uh, help us uh, do a, 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 a proper testing of the uh, of the RNA. And then for antigen test kit, it's also similar because uh, you know some of the antibodies, or for example the abdomen we use may also degrade because of some of the enzymes from the uh, 
uh, uh, human body as well. So, so, so yes, another big, big uh, area of research is uh, developing reagents that can help us to uh, better prepare the sample for testing. Uh, in fact, I think uh, uh, problem. I think your your lecture is very impressive. In fact, uh, I have uh, one more question. The so you have actually developed all these kits. All right. How easily will you be able to the what you call that uh, get into the global market for the what you call that their sales to benefit the the, the huge population that needs to be tested? Right. Yeah. So it's actually. Uh... I found it actually more difficult than doing the, exp the experiments or the research itself because after that, then, uh, okay, we have a company that licensed the technology. And then the next thing is we do manufacturing and the manufacturing itself is actually not trivial because uh, normally for a diagnostic kit, it will take about a year to one and a half years. And we're talking about doing this within two to three months. And then you have to go through all the different uh, certification and so on. You know, let's say, for example, you come up with a PCR uh, unit uh, the person, uh, it should be safe enough such that the person won't get electrocuted when they are operating it. You know, there, are, there are many different certification tests that need to be done. Then we have to perform the uh, regulatory approval test. That means we have to test with actual clinical samples to show that we are able to positively detect positive samples. And if it's negative samples, it should be negative. And then after that, uh, we need to you know that they need to have this whole uh, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, ability to, to manufacture so many uh, uh, of this uh, device, uh, this uh, test kit, and then to reach out. But I think for a start, uh, at least the company that's commercializing ours, we are looking at more the ASEAN region uh, first. Uh, you know, before we talk about uh, other countries, uh, because uh, the world is really, you know, firstly that you know, we are talking about seven million people, billion people, and, and we are only targeting, targeting ASEAN itself is really big enough actually for us. So what sort of time frame are you talking about that you can bring it to market? Yeah, so we are talking about like two, three months or at most four months. That means uh, early early next year, very early part of next year. That, that, that is very, very good news if you can get it done within that short period. I, I think the other thing is also, uh, if you look at our PCR, actually PCR is a, a, a very universal platform. So it's not just for uh, COVID-19, uh, it can actually be used for testing other viruses or other diseases as well. So uh, moving forward, uh, post-COVID, we are also looking at seeing whether we can use our test kit uh, to test other diseases, other respiratory diseases, for example. Thank you very much, Prof Lim, for a very impressive talk. Thank you. Thank you. No, Prof Lim, sorry, uh, two more technical questions. I forgot to ask just now. Oh, okay. Whether your RNA extraction procedure and the cDNA generation procedures are part of your kit? Or those are those have to be done before we use your kit. Yeah, so uh, yes. So basically, uh, uh, yeah. There's so there are two parts. But if the uh, PCR reagent does not include the RNA extraction, then we need to do an RNA extraction step separately. Uh, but we are actually looking at using uh, reagents that can do the RNA extraction. So in Singapore, we are developing uh, a Resolute test kit uh, by uh, by ASTAR, uh, and uh, that particular test kit can do the RNA extraction. So with that uh, reagent, then we can do everything all in one go. That means we take a sample, we put it into the uh, microfluidic chip, and then put in the, the, R, the reagent, and the extraction will be done uh, together with the PCR process. It will be convenient, yeah. That's and your right. antibody test, is it the fingerprint test? Uh, the antibody test I talk about uh, is a fingerprint test, yes. Uh, then uh, the antigen test is still using nasal swab. Thank you. I think there was a question put up by one of the audience. Okay. Yeah. Um, earlier on. I think there's one question about yeah. learning algorithms, right? Machine learning algorithms to detect COVID-19 cases. Um, yeah. Can we have the question? Okay, I think one, one question is by Jason. Uh, hi, Jason. Yeah, so we have actually not used machine learning algorithms to detect COVID-19 cases. Uh, but one of my uh, uh, colleagues who is doing uh, uh, breath, uh, breathalyzer tests, they are using uh, machine learning algorithms because they are looking at volatile organic compound uh, using mass spec. Uh, so that one, they use uh, machine learning. But for us, is uh, we can actually be able to tell yes or no from the fluorescence. Uh, uh, we don't really need a machine learning algorithm at the moment. And then for uh, 
uh, Prof Chiu, I think uh, Prof Chiu was asking about comment on the differences between the mRNA based and the adenovirus based vaccine and their relative safety and efficacy. Uh, so, uh, because I don't really develop vaccine, I'm not not uh, I can't really comment that. But I think uh, I know that uh, there is one company that is using HIV uh, virus component to detect uh, uh, to, to to do the vaccination uh, to, to to do the vaccine. Uh, but I just read the news yesterday that they actually stop it at the moment because people who has uh, that when they they did the clinical trial, those that has been vaccinated. Uh, uh, vaccinated with that HIV ty uh, based type of vaccine, uh, when they go for HIV test, they will also test positive for HIV, although they were actually negative. Uh, so, so there were uh, some uh, problem uh, arising from uh, using uh, you know, HIV type uh, of uh, you know, based type of uh, vaccine. Uh, I think there's a question from Facebook about how accurate Brathonics is. So Brathonics actually uh, is a startup from NUS. Actually, I was actually kind of involved in that project about six years ago because the student, the CEO is actually a PhD student. I was involved in the thesis advisory committee. Uh, and uh, we started uh, initially looking at uh, lung cancer. And then when they started the company, they pivoted to uh, COVID-19 uh, last few months. I think they did reported that they can achieve accuracy of about 93 or 94 uh, percent of detection. Uh, of course, Brathonics itself is still a screening tool. So uh, if it's tested positive, we will still have to perform PCR tests to confirm that the person has been infected. Um, and then I think there's a second question from Jason. Uh, is that uh, he heard from local newspaper about four persons having issue after taking the Pfizer about uh, tech vaccine. Uh, how do you think about it? Um, I, I think the issue is probably allergies, if I'm not wrong, because I read about the news mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. So uh, I, I think it definitely for sure there will be uh, cases like this because uh, you know clinical trial involves you know fifteen thousand uh, where they put under placebo and fifty thousand being vaccinated, so altogether thirty thousand. But now we're talking about millions, and, and for sure out of the millions you're probably going to have certain problem cropping up. Uh, there are certain people that may actually react uh, adversely to the vaccine. So, so time can only tell, I think, uh, you know, for those, I think they, they did say that for those who have allergies, they should uh, try not to or, or avoid uh, going for this vaccination. And I think the last one is uh, by Yijin. It says that, uh, may I know, is there any reason for the loss of taste and smell for COVID-19 patient uh, yeah, so this is actually one of the symptoms of COVID nineteen infection, and uh, I can't re I can't recall. I think there was uh, we were talking about it a few months ago, but I think it has something to do with the receptors on the cell in the nas nasal region and and, uh, and the, uh, the the mouth, the oral, the, the tongue itself. Uh, there was certain uh, I think receptors has been infected. But I can't re I can't recall what. But yes, the the uh, taste and smell loss is actually one symptom people are looking for for COVID-19 patients. But there are some publications on this, so you may be able to uh, read it up. Yeah. It's not, these are not specific symptoms for COVID, because some other viruses can also cause this disturbance in smell and the taste. All right, yeah. So, so I guess you have to look at the combination of different uh, symptoms plus testing, yeah. Okay, uh, we would like to take a group photo. Okay, can, can everyone please turn on your camera? Okay, okay we wait for a while, yeah? Let the participants turn on their camera. Okay, ready? One, two, three, smile. Okay, hold ya. Hold on. We're taking a few shots.
Okay, very nice. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Now, and thank you so much, Prof. Lim, thank you. Thank for you so your much. sharing session. It was very, very uh, yeah. <laughs> impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone, for attending. Thank you, Prof. Lim thank and Prof. Prof. Niao. Thanks, Sujitik, uh, for a wonderful talk. <laughs> Can we write to you for more details? Uh, yes, yeah, please do. <laughs> to be so inspiring for our postgraduate students. And one day, hopefully, I can go to KL again. Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> let's hope. <laughs> to visit you all. <laughs> the MCO thing, let's hope it's going to be done with soon. <laughs> I'm missing visiting KL actually. <laughs> You're, <laughs> You're the most food. welcome. Good as well. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. okay. Uh, our next webinar will start at 1 p.m. Please join us for the Science Communication and Innovation 2020 webinar titled Harry Enhanced Oil and Grease Threat for Cleaner Environment. Thank you.